Thank you, brother. And uh, good morning to each and every one of you. Uh, it's such a joy and delight and privilege for me uh, to be invited by Dr. York and to uh, worship the Lord together, uh, to open his word. And uh, I'd like to invite you to, if you have your copy of the New Testament, to open up to the book of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And as you're turning there, again, let me say uh, just how excited uh, many of us are uh, in the Ohio Presbytery of the PCA by our growing relationship with this institution and this seminary. Uh, last month, uh, before your uh, fall quarter began, and Dr. York uh, taught a church planning seminary, there were a few of us who came over and greatly uh, profited and benefited from that class, and it's good to see some familiar faces uh, here this morning, and uh, we are excited. So on behalf of uh, the Ohio Presbytery of the PCA, I also want to give you greetings uh, and our prayers and encouragement and well wishes. And we're so thankful for this institution uh, that holds high the glory and gospel of Jesus Christ, that is encouraging uh, students and men and women to come and gather and to study under pastors and to be prepared to go and love people in the name of our Good Shepherd. And so for me, I've already come to have a, a very special place in my heart uh, for this institution. Uh, and there's people. And our pastoral intern, Tony Karosha, is, is, we've been praying for him in Greek uh, and his professor. Uh, and he's getting all the, it's all Greek to me jokes uh, back in Canton. And so we're delighted. Last night, I will say, um, when at Bible study, when I was sharing and asking for prayer that I would be here this morning and preaching in chapel, I also shared uh, Dr. York's uh, encouragement that the uh, sermon is usually limited to 20 minutes, and so many in Canton are praying that I will stick to 20 minutes. Usually I'm just at my first point or the introduction, but nonetheless, uh, we will trust the Lord and the Spirit to be at work. Uh, many of you know I won't spend too much time just within the context of Philippians, I'm sure, uh, as you have a wonderful scholar in New Testament studies, and he can fill in some of the gaps here, but many of us will remember that the Apostle Paul uh, as we learn in the book of Acts, particularly chapter 16, the, the beginning of the church in Philippi had an amazing beginning. It had an amazing start. And we think of uh, Lydia and, and the ch this first church in Philippi being started in her home. Uh, and then the miraculous event with Paul and, and the Philippian jailer and all those things that Luke records for us uh, in the book of Acts, just astounding to see God's hand at work and growing and blessing and establishing the church in Philippi. But the church in Philippi, like all of us who are sinners and all New Testament churches from then until now, as they grew, they also grew in their own mess and in their own sin. And so the Apostle Paul has uh, picked up pen and put it to parchment and has been encouraging and admonishing and reminding these Philippian believers of their identity in Christ, of the joy of Christ, particularly as factions and factionalism and personalities began to, to sprout up and, and people began to go around insisting upon their own way. And in chapter two, we have this uh, beautiful, uh, many would call it a, a hymn uh, in Philippians two of Paul talking and recording of the contrast with the Philippian self-righteousness and arrogance that was sprouting up, with the beautiful humility of our Lord Jesus Christ, such that Paul would say, if there's anybody who could have ever insisted upon their own way, surely it was Jesus of Nazareth. But even he didn't count his equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself. And so he's encouraging these believers and all of us to, to have this same mind in us as was in our Lord, to not consider ourselves to be of great value or worth or significance, to do nothing from selfish ambition. And what I love about the letter uh, to the Philippians is we see all these great contrasts, right? There's, there's light and darkness. There's death and life. And what I want to talk briefly with you this morning, particularly in chapters 3, verses 1 through 11, uh, just two points, is the contrast of loss and gain. What does loss and gain really look like? In ministry, in seminary, in the academy, in our own spiritual development. 
Before we look to God's word, let's look to him again in prayer. Father, this is your word, and we are uh, the beneficiaries of it. And you're so kind to write it to us and to condescend to speak to us. We're so thankful for the truths contained here, and we pray that you would write these truths upon all of our hearts. Lord, we confess our sins before you, and we pray that the Spirit might do the necessary spiritual open heart surgery that's necessary. Lord, may these words that Paul spoke about himself, may they be true of us. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear now the inerrant and inspired word of the Lord. Philippians 3, beginning in verse 1 and going through verse 11. Paul writes, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Amen. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Loss and gain. As we think about our own lives and in our culture and the world around us, and even as something in wonderful and beautiful as a pastoral ministry or missionary service or theological education, how would we use or what would we use as a barometer to measure loss and gain? Well, certainly as we see in the world around us, we look at things as gain as bigger is better, right? When you start a church, when you teach at a seminary, the more you have, the better. The more successful a resume you can produce, the better. The more, quote unquote, success you're able to have in your life, the better. The more you're liked, the more you're listened to, the more you're followed, the more you're paid, the 2.5 kids who never get in trouble, all those things that we measure up as gain. And then how do we measure loss? Loss is the loss of a job or brokenness or failure or the lack of those things. A small church, uh, a small resume, uh, seeming insignificance, being ordinary instead of extraordinary. But the Apostle Paul, like so much of the New Testament, turned things on our head. Just like our Lord Jesus, who himself said, whoever would save your life must lose it. And Paul's just reminded us that everything that he thought as Saul of Tarsus was gain was actually loss. If you want to look at a resume, nobody had a spiritual uh, resume like Saul of Tarsus, and he's given it for us here in the text. Look, he said, if anyone wants to, you want to play the boasting game? You want to talk about credentials and curriculum vitae? I, I, no one could beat me. 
circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. He was zealous. He was righteous in everything that he thought, ironically, as gain, not only in the world, but even in the church, even among God's covenant people in Israel as a Pharisee. When he understood the true nature of who the Lord was, it was actually loss. It was loss. I think back as I look at your faces, and I remember I was just where uh, you are 12 years ago at a seminary that will remain nameless, as Ed has asked me never to repeat out loud <laughs> the institution that I went to. Again, I'm thankful for RPTS. <laughs> but drop one letter, and that's a hint. But I remember when I went off to seminary in the, in the fall of 2008, and I felt called to seminary, uh, after some wrestling and struggling, but I felt called after many uh, in my congregation and other friends and family had encouraged. And as I'd shared my testimony and begun to have opportunities to exercise some, some gifting. And so people tell you when you're young, wonderful things. And that's wonderful. But like a lot of people young in the faith, uh, I believed them. <laughs> and that was a problem. And you go to seminary, and in your own church, you think, oh, he's the most spiritually mature, the great preacher. You're going to be a great pastor, the next Spurgeon or R.C. Sproul. Then you go to seminary, and in fall uh, homiletics class, we, had, uh, we got paired up. We had chapel, and we had, we had preaching labs. And I'll never forget my first preaching lab. Uh, I follow. We had two students would preach every week, and I had to follow, and I'm not making his name up, literally Captain Joe Steele is his name, okay? This guy flew uh, fighter jets for the Air Force uh, in, the, in the war in Iraq. And sh remember shock and awe in 2003? He was one of them who was dropping bombs for shock and awe, okay? This guy was literally the whole deal. I mean, he had the looks. His name is Joe Steele. He was a captain. I'm not, again, he's a PCA pastor. You could listen. I'm going to send him this recording. He's going to laugh at me. But uh, he got up and preached, and it was like hearing Spurgeon. And I'm thinking, me who was starting to put confidence in my flesh and say, hey, you know what? I think I could do this. I think I can learn. I think I could be a pastor. I could be a preacher. But when I got up to preach, I felt two inches tall. And I'm so grateful the Lord continues to humble me. Because what I thought was gain was lost if I was putting my confidence in me. And thinking, I remember going to seminary and wanting to do great things for the Lord. Can I tell you now, being ordained uh, almost 10 years, I just want to make it. <laughs> I just want to remain faithful. I want to be married to my wife and have my son grow up and not hate me or the church. <laughs> if we could do that and know Jesus Christ, there's nothing better than that. Now, friends, there, I love being a pastor and a church planner, and I love pastoral ministry. I wouldn't want to do anything else. It is wonderful, and I'm, I'm, I'm jealous for you as you're in seminary and starting out and getting ready to go on the field. It's a, it's a sweet season of life. I wish I could go back some days. And it, you'll never, you'll look back on these days and these friendships and, and relationships cultivated, and you'll be so grateful. I know you will. Uh, but as wonderful as all of that is, it can become loss if we don't focus on what truly is gain. Loss in ministry would actually would be having a successful, quote-unquote, career. If you go and plant a church, or if you pastor a church, if you, if you grow a church, if you're beloved, if all these things, and yet you're not able to say with Paul that I count it all as loss for the sake of Christ. Do you love Jesus Christ? Do you know him and the power of his resurrection? Because that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. As Tony just mentioned in prayer, we, a Phoebe Kelly, she just turned 16 uh, last month. And she came up to me a few months ago. Uh, I was preaching a sermon series on the Gospel of Mark, and she came up to me, and without her parents hearing it, she didn't want to uh, alarm them or offend them. But she said, you know, Pastor Lee, I know I'm not going to grow up and become married and have children and have the life that I've always wanted. But Jesus is better than all of that, isn't he? 
Yes, he is. Jesus is better than all of that. Jesus is better than if you have a successful ministry. Jesus is better than if you get straight A's. Jesus is better than if you have what a lot of Americans or what a lot of the Protestant evangelical church promotes as gospel ministry, but it's just the American dream. It's just bigger is better. And ordinary is seen as loss. Ordinary seems, and that's why we, we're tempted sometimes to make ministry uh, or evangelism or teaching or theological education. We're tempted that we've got to add to it. That all these uh, movements, and I understand and appreciate some of them, but these movements towards contextualization and so much cultural accommodation, we feel like we've got to do things to win people. We feel like we have to add to the gospel. We have to either dumb it down or change it. And yet Paul elsewhere said uh, to the Corinthians, he said, And when I came to you, brothers, did I not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom? For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then he says, this is the Apostle Paul admitting this. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Who admits that? When you're interviewing one day with a committee, you're going to say, actually, I'm kind of terrified. I'm weak. Don't hire me. You know, it's the, it's the most strange and cornball thing ever, interviewing a candidate at a place, because you're supposed to be humble, but you need to convince a committee why you're the best guy for the job. It's the strangest thing. But leave it up to the Lord. He'll take care of it. Give him all the reasons. That's what I tried to do with church planning. I turned it down twice. And I gave him three reasons why I was not the right guy to plant this church. One of them I'll tell you is I don't look good in skinny jeans. There's nothing skinny about me. <laughs> I'm not your typical PCA church planter. <laughs> M&A's not listening. That's okay. I thought I had good reasons, but behind that, there were really excuses. Because under that, I was the opposite of what Paul here. I was afraid, well, what if we try to plant a church? And what if I fail? That, to me, would have been loss. But Paul says gaining Christ, to know Christ, is gain. And I had to ask my own heart and myself, whose glory is this really for and about? Am I in ministry for me to make a name for myself, to build a resume for myself, or am I want to be about the kingdom? What if God called you to a place that was hard and difficult, and in an earthly sense, it didn't work out? But if that was his divine plan, and that's what was good and what was best, would I go? What if God called you? And sometimes success can be more dangerous than failure because you don't always learn these lessons. The loss is missing out on a relationship with Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, I know you've experienced it because I experienced it in seminary. It is very easy to make theology, when, when it's your job to read the Bible, it's very easy to make that vocational and academic and not fill up the well of your heart spiritually. One of my favorite quotes, Robert Murray McShane, the great 19th century Scottish pastor, said, my congregation's greatest need is my own holiness. Friends, you can minister from an empty well for just so long, for just so long. My people's greatest need is my own walk from the Lord. Because as we're walking and staying close to Christ, guess what? You can't help but share him. You can't help but love in his name. That's why Paul was able to say, everything I had, I counted as loss. It's the opposite, that I might gain Christ. The Apostle Paul, who knew what it was like to be on the other side, who knew what it was like to live for himself and for success and for all of these other things that are fine in and of themselves. Well, I'm not here uh, downplaying, you know, we, we want success, right? We want large church. We want churches to grow. We want churches to be healthy. We want people to do well. I'm not downplaying success. I'm just saying be careful for the, the uh, allure and the illusion of success. God never calls us to success. He calls us to faithfulness. And I haven't forgotten. I wrote it down, and it stuck with me ever since Dr. York said it at the close of the church planning seminar. He said, one day when we all stand before the Lord, he's not going to say to us, well done, thou good and successful servant. But well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
Paul says, all of this is lost compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, of being found in him in justification. I love the way he phrased it. He doesn't say that I might find him, that I may be found in him. So when God looks at his perfect son in full obedience and in the radiance of his glory, as he's looking at his son, I'm right there with him. United by faith through the power and application of the Holy Spirit not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him. There's nothing better than knowing Jesus Christ. And you know what I had to learn in that call to church planning? If I don't really believe this, how can I tell anyone else? A friend of mine says it very simply, you can't sell what you don't own. Do I really believe this? And if I'm going to tell people Sunday after Sunday and Lord's Day after Lord's Day that you can trust the Lord, that you can follow him, that you can walk with him, am I willing to do that? Am I doing that? Do I want to, am I here because I want to know the power of the resurrection, that I want to know him, that I do think that there's nothing better. Give me Jesus. You can have everything else. I don't need anything else. I just need him and the fellowship of his life. And then another contrast, and I find this phraseology uh, so interesting. He says, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. We would think the logic would be the other way, right? It would go death and then resurrection. But Paul here says, that I may know his resurrection, which leads me to share in his suffering and his death. So as I look in my justification, in my union with Christ, and as I'm freed up, now as I'm living the Christian life, it's not the American dream. After I'm assured of the eternal inheritance and the riches of Christ, then he leads me through the valley of suffering and of struggling. Well, my time is up. (laughs) One thing I am grateful for is Paul starts, finally, my brothers, and he goes on for two more chapters. So... (laughs) I find that great encouragement. That I may any means possible obtain the resurrection of the dead. Friends, I close with this. What's loss and gain for you? It's good to, we need to work hard and glorify the Lord in everything we do. We want to be faithful men and women of the word. We want to be faithful servants in the church. We want to, but at the same time, we don't want to get A's in class and C's in our marriage, right? Or, or neglect in sharing the hope of Jesus Christ. But there's nothing better. Have we really tasted and seen that there is nothing better than knowing Christ? That's the real barometer of gain and loss. Do we know Jesus? Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the joy of knowing and following Christ. We pray that you would guard all of our hearts against uh, the... The seduction of this world and society, which presents a picture of what faithful ministry might look like, but it's not according to your word. It's according to our own worldly values and systems. Lord, we want to do well and remind us that the true barometer of doing well is being faithful. May we not turn to the left or to the right, but may we stay centered in the means that you have promised to use to build and equip and disciple your church, the ordinary means of grace. May we all be leaders and followers in Acts 2, 42 type churches that model a devotion to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. We thank you for our time together, for our focus and attentiveness on you. Thank you for meeting with us. I pray for each and every one of these students and faculty and administration. I pray that you might just bless spiritually this institution, prosper her richly, Uh, for the advance of your kingdom and for the fame of your name. And we pray this in the mighty and matchless name of King Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing our concluding hymn. Oh, a psalm, excuse me. Ed told me to say that. Our concluding psalm, the last three stanzas of Psalm 118E.